Okay. All right. Okay. So thanks everyone for coming tonight. Right, and then you all use it are online. Right, and uh, and so tonight we are um, we're pleased to have uh, two speakers from Microsoft, and they're going to be talking about Kubernetes fundamentals. So we've got Tommy and Kendall. Kendall. Yep. Right. And so, uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing their uh, their conversations. And then once again, just remember, if you got a question, let's uh, I'll, I'll try to raise the mic over to you so that we can get that, get that in the stream as well. Uh, so with that, take it away. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. All right. Also, I want to thank uh, our sponsors for food and the menu tonight, uh, Datadog. Thank you all very much. Uh, you were asking about observability. They're the answer. They're the, one of the answers, but they're the answer. Um, so hi, my name is Tommy Faugu. I am a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I work specifically with uh, companies that write software and helping their software run on Azure. So um, yeah, and as a cloud solution architect, I'll very often be talking to our partners about, hey, this is what this looks like. Here's how to do the migration of an on-prem or in AWS and bring that on over into Azure. And Kendall, uh, pass this over to Kendall. Hi everyone, my name is Kendall Rubin. I've been at Microsoft for a little over three years now and recently joined a team called the Global Black Belt Team, but I focus specifically on cloud native architecture. So basically helping customers understand um, how they can move their workloads not only to Azure, but at scale. So a lot of like image driven development, a lot of AKS, uh, so a lot lots of good stuff there. <laughs> no shortage of work right now, as you can imagine. And to describe the Global Black Belt, uh, if anyone's ever seen Pulp Fiction, uh, whenever we need to call in the wolf, we call in the global back, black belts. All right. Oh, I want to do this slide quick because there are some questions we wanted to ask. So we wanted to ask you all, and just uh, use your hands, put up a number of fingers. On a scale of one to five, how comfortable are y'all, each of y'all, with containers? This is the audience participation one. Okay, so two, four, three, four, three, okay. Um, so, so I see some threes to threes to fours, and it seems like three is a good uh, average there. And so on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with Kubernetes? Two, one, zero. I think a zero that turned into a one. Four, all right. A nod. Yeah, it's like we have kind of a wide array, um, which is good, because I think we'll hit on concepts that will kind of lend to wherever you're at. So I think that'll be good. Cool. And is anyone using Kubernetes in production? This is a more of a Boolean. Yes, no. Yes, yes. Two. All right. 2.5. Uh, all right. And how many of you, of the ones that are using Kubernetes in production, how many of y'all are using it as a managed service? Or are you managing yourself? So yes, OK. Looks like all of them are using managed service. And how, which ones are you using? Yes. Yep, all right. I guess. AWS. Oh, AWS. Yeah. Azure. Azure. All right. Cool. So one out, of, uh, one out of three. Very well. So we will be talking about Kubernetes, and we will also be talking about the managed Kubernetes service. We'll, we'll reference AKS a number of times, but a lot of what you're hearing us talk about is going to be applicable to whichever cloud platform you're using. You know, because we're from Microsoft, yeah, we'll talk a bit about Azure and Azure's Kubernetes service, AKS. But don't worry, this is not a uh, this is not a sell of that. We're just going to talk about it from that perspective. All right, this is us. Uh, so by the end of this, we're oh actually yeah, uh, talk about the breaking this up into thirds. So we're going to kind of break this uh, presentation up into three parts. One of which is going to be covering over Kubernetes. This is what it is. These are some of the foundations. Uh, second part is going to be we're going to actually go through like deploy creating an AKS cluster, um, deploying some uh, basic AKS resources, and then the third section is going to be asking like truly any questions which we've got we'll we'll answer them. So before we get on to actually yeah let me finish this the objectives. Uh, by the end of the session you will understand how Kubernetes works and you'll understand how managed. Kubernetes works, uh, AKS being one of them. So before we get too far, here, actually, I want to let you hold this if you want to sure. say anything. And also, while he's getting that set up, feel free to interrupt us with questions as we go through. Don't feel like you have to hold something. You know, if there's something top of mind, that's relevant, feel free to chat it out. So can you walk through what I'm going to do here? 
Sure. So where we're going to start out before we really get into uh, kind of some of the more educational stuff is we're just going to kick off an actual Kubernetes cluster. So we're going to be using the, um, the command line in order to do this. So we can use a bash. And essentially what we're going to do here is just create a new AKS cluster. So once again, we're not really going to be talking specifically about AKS. Everything that we're talking about will really be applicable to Kubernetes, um, you know, vanilla, wherever you have it. Um, but what we're going to be deploying right now is actually an AKS cluster. So that's an Azure hosted Kubernetes instance. And because this is live, we want to show you that this is, we're not making anything up. Someone give me a random number. Eight. All right. So we're going to call this the uh, DevOps Live 8. Zoom in. Yep. I love it Okay, cool. And this dash. Okay. And so this is also all in GitHub. And so to start off with uh, in Azure, the first thing you do is you create a group. This group called a resource group is just where all your resources live. Um, there's not very much to it. It's just where everything goes in. How many of you in general are working with some type of cloud? Okay, so you're generally aware of most of those concepts. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we created this one in South Central because we wanted a bit close. And then the next thing we're gonna do is run AZ AKS create. Create me in AKS, a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this is, we're now gonna go back into the presentation slide because we wanna have this run in the background. Now, one thing to keep in mind, and we'll make sure that we touch on this as we go, is AKS Create is actually extracting a lot of the complexity of Kubernetes, right? When you're setting up Kubernetes yourself, there's going to be a lot that goes into what's actually kicking off whenever you hit that API um, in Azure that you would have to do manually. So we'll try to contrast that a little bit, but just keep in mind, it's definitely <laughs> there's definitely a lot going on behind the scenes there. Cool. Um. Well, hopefully, hopefully by now you understand what a container is. It's a logical isolation of your application. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly because, again, hopefully you're familiar with this. But in a container, you've got your application, you've got this in this bundle. It is actually a tar gzip file that has the image for all the files that your application needs to run. Rather than a virtual machine where you need to think about spinning up the virtual machine and spinning up uh, all the kernel itself, it uses the existing kernel of the operating system it's running on to bring up your application, bring up that TGZ, and uh, just run those specific files as opposed to running the entire instance of a kernel. Ask a couple questions here, is that okay? Yes. Are y'all, do y'all like audience engagement? Are y'all okay with that? Does anyone know kind of what are the underlying bits that actually create the isolation of container that you know we can consider a container, right? What does it use from the underlying host to actually be able to create the isolated sandbox? Secrets. Hypervisor, not necessarily. C groups, C -groups and namespaces. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of what I was going for, right? So um, it's really important to understand that we're using these concepts that are built in to the machine in order to isolate this area, right? Um, and from a DevOps perspective, why is having a container useful? Before containers, what did we have to put on a virtual machine to make our application run? Operating system, for sure. But also, we I don't know, have any of y'all ever seen an Excel spreadsheet that had a bunch of different libraries, the versions, and all of that needed to be installed on the machine in order to run your application, and then you do out of date dependency, application doesn't run. So the goal of being able to put these um, you know, dependencies with the application itself in a container is that now we can be sure that as we deploy across environments, we're getting exactly what we need. Right? We don't have to do that preemptive setup of making sure the VM has everything configured already. Well, cool. Also, it's prevention of contamination from other libraries. Yes. 100%. It's really their applications. It isolates the application. Totally. Yep. And making sure that you can run maybe concurrent applications that are using different versions of different libraries and packages, right? We can run those concurrently on one VM and get better isolation there as well. So just want to make sure that we all kind of talk from that perspective. Cool, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, you get that logical isolation. It's the mutable object of your application. So hey, what do we run containers on? Well, we run them on Docker. How do we create our containers? We use a Docker file. This is how, um, what Ken was talking about, that spreadsheet of all these different libraries you need to install. Well, you now use infrastructure as code to say, 
this is exactly what I want to install when I'm creating this bundle for my application, this container image for my application. I say this is where I wanted uh, the base image that I want to use. Uh, this is Alpine, a very light one. You could be using Ubuntu. Then you have the run, which says, hey, run this package. This could be installing each of these libraries we're talking about. And then the CMD is this is the, 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 uh, the process that I want you to run uh, whenever, or the command I want you to run whenever you start up the container. Well, we've got this image. We created this bundle. Huzzah. What do we need now? Well, we need a container registry. What does a container registry do? It stores images. So those TGZ files I was talking about, great. Now we have a central location to store all those and put all those in so that we can start downloading them from whatever machine we're running on, be it local, be it sharing. This could be used as a sharing platform. Docker Hub is the most popular one, uh, most popular container registry that people are familiar with. What if I wanted to make changes to an image? How would I make changes to an image? You what? Re you recreate it, right? So that's the really important part, right? The Docker file is going to be the thing that's versionable, the asset that you say, hey, an image is immutable, right? If I want to, cre if I want to make a change to an image, I need to create the, the Docker file for that and basically create a new image, right? So the, the concept of images being immutable is really important when we talk about the DevOps process. That's a kind of a trick question. It's like, how do you recreate an image? You don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it is a trick. And these containers just be kept in you could, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, because it is, you can boil it down to a single file. That's really what it is, again, that TGZ file. Uh, Docker, uh, Docker Hub is not a place for artifacts because think, Docker is great, I'm sorry, uh, GitHub. GitHub is not a place you want to store your artifacts um, because you want to store your code, your raw code, and then anything that's generated from that, you know, those artifacts, that's what you want to store in an artifact repository such as the container registry. So, so, so basically, um, just to kind of like build off that, typically your, the code that you're writing every day, your application code would go really well in something like GitHub. Now there are multiple uh, image repositories. They basically all have kind of a standard format um, or can store standard format images. And so typically what you would recommend, Docker Hub being kind of the main public repo, but for production workloads, you typically want to invest in a secure private registry. So something like Azure Container Registry, I believe, Amazon has their own. If you use uh, OpenShift, which is another container platform, they also have uh, a container registry. So it's more of an actual separate entity that you would invest in and store your images there. Right. So, so GitHub announced, uh, I believe it was last month, the GitHub package registry. And so now it can be your Docker uh, repository. Awesome. Why are so, we not learning this? Why are we learning <laughs> oh, this here? <laughs> I actually think I have heard that before. Yeah, yeah. so you, you store the, the <laughs> Source code, right, in your repository, sort of code repository, but but your artifacts, they they are now the artifact repository as well. Mm -hmm. okay, so typically, your Docker file can be checked in via source code. Like you would have your Docker file maybe with the um, the application that it's actually going to you know look at and build into an image. But typically, once that image is built, you're going to push it to a registry where you know obviously other people can pull that image down securely. Good question. Thank you very much. Also, we'll repeat the questions moving forward in case you don't oh, hear it. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, so then different, reg uh, different registries, OpenShift has one, uh, Azure as well, Docker Hub. Cool. We've got containers. We've got a registry. Now what? Well, now we've got one container. We want to start adding more containers because we've got container A. Oh, did you have a question? Sorry, what? So artifact, I think, is just kind of a code output, right? It's yes. just artifact a, a, being a generalized term for, like, you could technically say that an image is an artifact that's created, right? It's a type. Uh, the container image is a type of artifact. Uh, code. Yeah, like a, a jar file is really an artifact. So whenever you're talking about artifact, it's usually you take your code and you produce something that you might deploy with. That's what I, that's an artifact. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's one type of artifact. The result of a Docker build would be the image, the container image. Um, so the artifact is just a type of. Uh, it's like kind of using it like to say output, right? It's just a generalized term for like the output of something that you've. Jar, war. Those are all yeah. examples of 
out uh, of artifacts. So we're, uh, now we want to start running more and more containers, and more and more, and more and more, until chaos happens. Well, this is where a container orchestrator comes in. We've heard of, of a few different ones, but what is a container orchestrator? Well, as we run all these different containers, what if one dies? What if a host dies? What do we want to do there? What if we want to have my container run at a certain time? What if I don't want my container to run more than 35% of the CPU? These are all the types of, uh, I like to think of them as puppeteering that you want to do when managing your containers. Okay, so do I have any Cowboys fans? Anybody? Football fans at all? So as you can imagine, right, like if we had all of the players go out on the field and didn't give them specific assignments and didn't really tell them what to do and they just all ran at the ball, um, we'd probably be watching like a little kid soccer game, right? So at some point, we need somebody to step in and be like, hey, you're going to be here, this is your job, you're going to communicate with this person, you're going to throw the ball here, this is the play, right? So that's where a container orchestrator kind of is in the container world. Once you start containerizing your applications, eventually you're going to want to scale those, right? You're going to want to be able to run them on multiple machines, maybe even in multiple environments. You're going to need to make sure that some of them know how to communicate with each other. So that would be really fun to manage, um, said no one ever, right? You don't want to have to manage that at scale. And so the orchestrator really allows us to scale that management capability that would be quite messy if we did that ourselves. So when it comes to container orchestration, typically what we see is there's going to be a master and a series of nodes, regardless of which container orchestrator that we use. Um, but kind of just what I wanted to show you here is typically the container orchestrator is going to be running on a machine, right? It could be a physical machine, it could be a virtual machine, but typically you're going to isolate a single machine to run the actual kind of container orchestrator or at least the software that's going to orchestrate over the rest of the virtual machines or physical machines. And that's going to operate, obviously, over what we consider a cluster. So moving forward, a cluster is just a group of virtual or physical machines. Cool? Awesome. So over time, um, and does anyone know when containers like really were created? Like When did containers come on the scene? What would you say? I thought it was done by Google engineers back in the early 2000s. OK, Google engineers in the 2000s. Anybody else have any ideas? So the first, like, the first container technology really started around like, 1960. So Linux containers, LXC, is really where like, containers were born. Right? Some of these underlying kernel technologies, that's really the precipice of some of this stuff. Now, Docker came on the scene, right? I think it was like 2013. And they were like, let's popularize this technology that has been pretty much unusable um, unless you were really, really deep and very infrastructure focused in the past. So Docker really popularized the technology and made it what it is now, which is why containers have become so popular. Um, but as that's happened, obviously people wanted to capitalize on, on that and they knew that orchestration was going to be necessary. So that's when people started kind of coming on these orchestrators. So we'll go through a couple of different um, orchestrators. So one of them being, I should have brought my clicker, that was a fail. Um, one of them is Mesosphere DCOS, so they actually came out with their own orchestrator. Um, and then we had things like Docker Swarm. So Docker obviously being the, I would say the most popular or widely adopted local development tool for containers, um, also a container runtime, all of that stuff. It's kind of multifaceted in that sense. Um, but really, then Kubernetes came on the scene and became the de facto standard, right? So it's not the only container orchestrator by any means, but it's definitely where the industry is going, right? The same way that Docker kind of won the container game, um, Kubernetes has won the container orchestrator game. Uh, so what is Kubernetes? Essentially, it is exactly what we said, right? It's one flavor of container orchestrator with its goal of helping you manage these large, work, work large workloads, especially from a scalability and failover perspective, things of that nature, being able to do rolling updates, being able to upgrade your cluster, all of those sort of things that, um, that obviously Kubernetes is going to help you do. And if you're uh, kind of going with the whole nautical theme, right, there's so many nautical themes like Docker and then obviously Kubernetes being kind of like the captain of your container ship. So it totally makes sense that that's what we would call it. So as I mentioned before, we have our master. And typically, like I said, the master components can technically be deployed anywhere inside a Kubernetes cluster. But best practice is that it should run on one machine altogether. And you typically are going to want to have at least two masters, right? When we're talking about high availability, uh, we don't want the master to go down, right? And that's actually going to be managed for you by managed service if you go with that option. Um, but just keep that in mind, right? The master is extremely important because it basically communicates with all of the nodes within your cluster. 
Any questions at this point? Like an actual progression. Yeah, so I have my, like, there's going to be some level of opinion to that. I'll give you kind of my take. So a big part of it is Kubernetes came out of the Borg project from Google, which I think is kind of what you were referring to. So Google basically created this orchestrator internally to manage all of their workloads, and they were like, whoa, this is really powerful, and we need to find a way to decouple it from our applications and our infrastructure to make it available to other people. So it was very battle-tested before it ever came to light, so I think that was a big, you know, a big compelling selling point is it ran a lot of the Google workloads, and so there was a lot of like, trusted, like, this has been battle-tested before. Another um, aspect is that Kubernetes got a lot of community adoption. Obviously, it is open source, so I think that was another big component, right? Docker Swarm, Docker going more of, uh, almost like an enterprise route, I would even say, to some extent. So Docker Swarm, not only does it not have the same level of functionality, um, it doesn't necessarily have the same community support. But Docker Swarm is much more uh, simple, and so it can still be suitable for certain workloads, especially when you're learning about container orchestration. You what? Docker Exactly. Yeah, Docker, yeah, Docker Desktop now has like built in Kubernetes, like a mini Kubernetes cluster you can run on your local machine. And then they're also supporting Kubernetes in their like Docker enterprise. So yeah, add to that. Sure. So one of uh, my belief is that sort of the same reason that uh, the Palm OS failed. Um, why did uh, Betamax fail? The community. Uh, they were able to drive the community better um, through Kubernetes. Also, when Docker was developing it, they had their set of engineers that they were working on it. And when Google open sourced it, well, the number of developers that were out there in the world that are able to contribute to that far surpassed any of the features that uh, Docker was able to release. So it just became like a, a economies of scale, just the sheer number of developers, bug fixes, and everything else. So, uh, and it's also the largest I think the highest number of stars and number of contributors on GitHub. Now, that's not to say Kubernetes is a perfect fit for everything, right? Sure. So I think we're also like, it, I think it's totally over the hype curve, like because we know that it can really do amazing things, but also it's not, not everything should run on Kubernetes most likely, right? We need to evaluate workload before we make that determination. So when it comes to switching gears just a little bit, to, yes, sure. So it's not what will not run on Kubernetes. It's if I don't have a, an application that needs high scalability, if I don't need an application that, um, like let's say I have a .NET Framework application that basically runs on one machine, you could containerize it, you could put it in Kubernetes, but like, do you need all the feature set, right? It's just kind of a matter of, do you want the operational complexity, do you want the cost, if you don't, you know, if you don't need it, right? So it's more just evaluating if it's necessary. The same way if you could service mesh, if anybody has anyone heard of Service Mesh? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you to be lucky or, but Service Mesh is now kind of coming on the scene to help with managing the network of Kubernetes clusters, and that adds a lot of complexity as well, but also it's kind of like, do I need that if I don't, if I don't need all the features set? So it's kind of just evaluating that from my perspective. Do you have another question? Yeah, totally. Operational complexity is much, much greater in Kubernetes. For sure. Yeah, especially if you want to do it well, right? There's a difference between learning the basics and then being able to run a production workload well in Kubernetes. Lots of YAML files, too. Lots of configuration. So, um, so yeah, just, just to, to switch gears, great questions. We see you coming. But we're going to, I just want to contrast what we talked about so far, right? Any Kubernetes cluster is going to have those components. But keep in mind that a managed service is basically going to be like a master as a service, right? So instead of having to manage the master node and all of its components, the cloud provider will do that for you. Now keep in mind, it's not, like if you come to use um, AKS specifically, Azure Kubernetes service, the management of the master is actually a free thing that we provide. The only thing that you're paying for is the nodes in your, in your cluster. So pretty much just the underlying infrastructure, whereas some other cloud providers will actually charge you for managing the master. So just something to keep in mind. So Kubernetes at 10,000 feet. We've already talked about the master and the clusters. We can keep cruising through here. Let's talk, I'm going to talk briefly through the components, and then we won't go too deep on this. Now, the reason is because the A, 
we're, we're kind of having more of a fundamentals conversation, but B, a lot of this is going to be abstracted away from you if you use a managed provider. So it's good to know what's going on here. It's good to make sure that you have the logs that are coming out of these different components, but you're not necessarily going to have to manage um, installing them and making sure that they're all running effectively. So on the master, we have the API server, which is basically kind of the um, what you're going to be interacting with from the command line. So whenever you want to basically do anything, apply anything, put anything into your cluster, make anything run, you're going to communicate that through kubectl, which is basically the command line, and that's going to talk to the API server. Then we have the controller manager, which basically manages a bunch of controllers. So the way that I like to think of controllers is basically they're the reconciliation engine. So they're going to make sure that your desired state is enforced over the cluster. Um, so if something's out of alignment in, in, on one of your nodes running the cluster, it's actually going to make sure that, hey, you said that this is what you want a desired state to be. That's not the case. Let's make sure that we reconcile that to get it as close to the desired state as possible. Um, NCD is the distributed backend data store for all of your, basically any kind of configuration that you want to put into Kubernetes. So as you can imagine, maybe you want to run a particular container, right? I won't get into how we call that in Kubernetes yet because I haven't learned it. But imagine you want to run two of one type of container. Most likely you're going to apply that to your cluster, and that configuration is going to get stored in NCD. So anytime the reconciliation engine is running, it's making sure that what you put in NCD is what the, what the actual cluster is. And then the scheduler is basically going to, let's say that you want shocking, what do you think the scheduler does? Schedule, great. Um, so the scheduler is basically going to say, hey, you said you wanted to run something on the cluster, let me find an available node, and let me make sure that that is running. Now the important thing that the scheduler also does, which is a little bit outside the scope of what we'll cover today, it enforces things like pains and tolerations, affinity and anti-affinity. So for example, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you're using one logically isolated cluster, right, which means maybe you have multiple teams that are all deployed to one cluster, and you're like, hey, Bob's team doesn't write really good code. I don't want my containers running on the same, which means that Bob's team's containers are running on, right? The scheduler would actually honor those rules if you put those into configuration. So it's going to schedule the workloads. Now, I'll touch briefly on what's running on each node as well. So we have the kubelet, which is basically what the API server is going to talk to to make sure all the containers are running. So if you say, I want five containers with this image running on this machine, the kubelet's going to make sure that those get executed. Um, is going to do a lot of just the DNS on, uh, on the node. Docker being your container runtime. And then, um, and do we have to use Docker in Kubernetes as a container runtime? Anybody know the answer to that? No. So there's multiple container runtimes that you can use in Kubernetes. They actually created one native in Kubernetes called Cryo. So that's not, I think it's still an incubating. Um, CNCF incubation phase. So Cloud Native Computing Foundation is definitely a website we're checking out. Basically, you can see any projects that are incubating, Kubernetes came through, um, any, any kind of the major open source projects are going to get adopted by the CNCF and go through a process before they become mature. And then um, DNA, uh, DNS, yeah. stuff, kind of, kind yeah. of Okay, so that's all going to be two stuff from here on out. So if you have any questions about that and you ask me anything, feel free. But a lot of that, like I said, is going to be abstracted away from you when you do that APS, APS create. It's going to make sure all of those components are up and available on all of the nodes in the cluster and that all of the master components are there as well. Awesome. So I'm going to pass it back off to Tommy. He's going to talk a little bit about where containers actually go once we get into Kubernetes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Back to me. So we've got our containers, we've got or we've got our images, and we've got our container uh, orchestrator. We want to mash the two together. Hey, you container orchestrator, please run these images. Where do they go? Well, technically, you don't deploy container. Well, you do deploy containers, but what you do is you tell Kubernetes, I want you to deploy a pod. The pod is a logical grouping. Usually, just one container could be more, but usually just one. So containers go inside pods. Then pods go on nodes. More pods, more nodes. So if you wanted to, um, I got it. Thank you. Um, so if you want to have multiple instances of these pods, you can say, "Hey, please run two instances of pod A." So great, pod A shows up here, and then pod A show also show up there. Well, what do these pods look like? To be honest, there's not much to them. It's just kind of metadata. Uh, it's data about the container. 
for some example data is please open this port. Whenever this container runs, open this port here. Please add this volume mount into the container. Please make sure that this is the amount of CPU it has, this is how much memory it has. Here's some labels, please add this, uh, this label to this. And also here is my container image I want you to run. Uh, here's to ex another example of almost the same thing except we're doing on a different port. We're using a different container image uh, and different labels and maybe that same volume. So out of curiosity for all of y'all, just take a look at all of y'all, so back. Um, such such a thing to say. So could all of those ports technically be the same port? Could they all could all of the ports be the same port? Are these different pods? No, they're different containers. Yeah. Yes or no? What do we think? How many think yes? How many think yes, it could be the same port? Yeah, so that's the question you should be asking, yes. right? So in this case, it's saying I want to basically expose the application running in this pod on port 3000. So you could use that multiple times because that's the internal port that you're exposing, right? Does that make sense? And then we're going to map that to so, any. Exactly. Yeah, similar. Very similar. So one pod can have multiple containers, right? One pod can have multiple containers. Yes. One pod. Uh, one pod. Yes. Each of those containers should listen to different ports. Correct. They should they listen to different ports because yeah, it's that pod is it's kind of like its own little VM. You can almost think of that logical isolation, uh, and those are all they can see each other through local hosts. Yeah. So you would basically put two things in a pod if they if in. A traditional setting, you'd have to deploy them to the same machine for them to function. And, and just to be clear, that's like inside the pod that there is the local host. But if you want to talk to other pods outside, we'll talk about how to do that. Does that make sense? I feel like it does. I feel like you yeah, have more questions. We'll get to that. We'll get, yeah. we'll get yep, there. Great question. Yeah, we'll we'll moving right along to that in a second. So pods are the atomic unit of what you install. Was there a question? So whenever you whenever you deploy a pod to Kubernetes, let's say that you say I want five pods running on the cluster, Kubernetes will load balance them across the available nodes. So it might put one on each. You know, if you only want three, though, it's going to only put it. Let's say you had five nodes and you wanted three pods. Most likely, three of those machines will get one pod, and two of them won't get one. So we're talking about those labels. Those labels are ways to say, hey, I want this type, this pod, to run on a node with this label as well. And they can do matching, they can do avoidance, they can try to have affinity for each other. And it's through intelligent use of labels that you can, uh, if you want to manipulate where this goes, you can, or you can just tell Kubernetes, figure it out. And that's usually what people do at first. And then they, they go down the progression of learning a little bit more and say, hey, uh, I want to be a little bit more uh, precise of how I want these uh, pods to be deployed. Did you have a question? Yeah, so it's it's a virtual machine or a so physical you, machine. Actually, let me repeat the question because I realize we haven't. Been oh doing yeah, yeah. That so the question was: Is the node a host? Yeah, the node could be either a bare metal machine. It could be a VM. Uh, it's usually like an, an actual operating system. It could be a Raspberry Pi. The pod is not a host. The pod is not a host. The pod runs on a host as part of a cluster. The pod is essentially a container with metadata around it. Yep. The pod is a yeah. C groups, namespaces, all that's still at play. So what are deployments? Well, deployments are more metadata, and they talk about how to deploy a pod. Now, whenever we're doing a pod, we're just saying onesie twosie, hey look, deploy this container. But if it dies, well, okay, cool, it died. Kubernetes doesn't care. But if you say a deployment, I always want two replicas of this. Uh, Kendo was talking about a reconciliation. If one dies, Kubernetes, that scheduler, will go and try to reconcile that and make sure that there are always two running, if it can. So the reason this is important too, just from perspective, let's say that we have an application, right? We have a front end and a back end, like pretty basic. Let's say that we've deployed those to a cluster by just running a command line, right? Like, hey, go run this one of these pods and one of another pod. 
And then let's say that, uh, I don't know, we hit a bunch of traffic, right? Somebody, for whatever reason, maybe we just got explosive traffic one afternoon. And somebody went into the command line and they were like, hey, scale up the front end and the back end to 10, 10 pods each, right? I'm going to run 10 of each of these. And then, and then somebody went in and updated the deployment to have two and didn't realize that somebody had gone into the command line and asked for 10, right? So it's actually scaling it down to eight. So we always want everything to be in configuration as code, right? Because you can go into the command line and scale up and down your workload and your applications, and if that's not somewhere stored, then we might go actually make a huge change to the cluster that wasn't documented. Does that make sense? So we want that to be in a deployment, right? We want to be able to manage that intelligently, not only for the other people that are working on the cluster, but also for ourselves so that we can guarantee if one of those goes down, another one will come up. Does that make sense? Okay. And the great way thing about this is that you're declaring. Uh, there's no bugs here. It's like, I want to. Now, there may be a bug in Kubernetes or something that prevents it from actually deploying that to, but you're, as an operator, saying, I want two of this and let Kubernetes figure this out. So hey, we told our deployment, we told that to Kubernetes, and then it's gonna try to go figure this out and says, hey, I'm gonna deploy ratings web one and web two on two different nodes because to, we told it. Yep. And to clarify, those are the same exact container. So they're not like one, one isn't called ratings web one and one's called ratings web two. That's just to show it's gonna go out and put two instances of the exact same thing. Because yeah, we asked for two of those pods. There are two pods using the exact same image. Yes. So there are clusters, one endpoint? Correct. There's uh, the one endpoint where, like, all that Coop stuff we were talking about. There's the API, which we're talking to. And you might have heard, heard of Coop Cuddle. Well, I'm talking about, like, the service. So, so we, right? haven't, we haven't talked about that yet. So basically what he was asking is, is it one endpoint? Because we just deployed two instances of the same image. Um, we haven't necessarily gotten to how would the networking work to make sure that we're load balancing across those two instances. So we'll touch on that in just a second. Yeah, so the question was, is it one endpoint and we'll get there. So now we are going to talk, talk to that same endpoint. We got our deployment. Oh, wait, sorry, before that. Hey, um, our pod died. It had a core dump or whatever, an out of memory error uh, on, on our first node. So it died. Well, what's going to happen? Remember that reconciliation that we told about earlier? Well, it knows this, and it's going to try to bring up another instance of that. Because again, we told it to Kubernetes is going to try to reconcile that for us. Does anyone remember what components would would make that happen? So the kube controller, yeah. So that would be the and etcd exactly. Yeah. So etcd is going to have two stored in there. The reconciliation engine is going to realize two aren't in there, and it's going to talk to uh, it's, the API server is going to talk to uh, the kubelet on the node to make sure another one comes up. Make sense? <laughs> Yep. Storing state. Uh -huh. Do you want to say it out so loud? We'll, okay, the question is, the new instance comes up, how do we manage state? In that? Because we now have a brand new instance. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the key point is you want to have your application so that there's like different types of state. Um, one is, hey, I need to pull in this uh, disk or this, uh, this set of files that have the state. You can use volumes. Kubernetes has the concept of what's called volumes, and those volumes can bring in uh, disks or um, mount volumes into that container. If you need to store state like a, for a database session, you usually try to store that external to the container itself. Because the concept and the idea is that these containers are going to die, nodes are going to happen, uh, chaos is chaos monkey is going to happen. And so when possible, you store your state external to the container, but still in something that can persist, to, that you either inject into the container or you talk to, the container talks to to manage that state for you. So my summary of that would be goal is don't store state inside of a pod. You don't want your pod to be stateful, right? At any given time, you want to be okay that that pod could totally go away, and you're persisting all of the state outside of the pod instance itself. Can you say that your state is uncontained? State is uncontained. You could say your you state, could just state is uncontained. Your state is, it's awesome. the same way that yeah. like writing to file instead of using a database, right? Goal is you have some type of external database where you're storing state or you have 
disks that have been mounted to the container. And when that container goes down, that, that mount is going to persist, and another container can come up and mount to it. Or you maintain it in a message broker. Maintain it in a message broker. Maintain it in Redis cache. Mm -hmm. uh, maintain it in a MySQL database. Anything that's not inside the container. Yeah. Uh, we will talk a little bit about stateful uh, containers that do manage state. But ideally, you want your application to be uh, to not manage state and have all the state external to it, so that whenever the next one comes up, it can do that. Uh, and the reason for that is when your applications are stateless, it's way easier to manage from a distributed system standpoint. Uh, because again, you don't care if, no if nodes can completely go down, and that's not going to affect your end solution. Mm. In in flight transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the same way with any distributed system, right? You need to have some kind of protocol that says like, oh, I need retry logic. I need like all of that's still going to be relevant, right? So like if it's trying to process something and that processing fails or it goes down, most likely it's not going to receive any kind of response, right? Great. Keep them keep coming. Um, keep happy. Yeah, sorry, the question was that if there's the challenge is what if two nodes go down? Okay. Again, you can have multiple nodes in this cluster so that everything gets rebalanced. The idea is that nodes and processes going down should not affect the, uh, the SLA and the SLO for your application itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the application's responsibility. And again, it, uh, if you can create those applications to not manage state and have that outside, such as if you're talking about, hey, if it's in flight, well, how did it receive that request? Maybe it can pull it from a message broker instead. Uh, HTTP, well, great. If you lose that, that connection could be gone. And maybe you could have retry logic. And that you kind of keep having to push that back up and up, up the chain. But you know, again, if it's pulling off a message broker, if that dies free. Just uh, the next container that pulls it up pulls that same message off again. So there's different ways of handling it from an application standpoint. Yeah, I think it's it's easy sometimes when you get into this kind of system to be like, oh, well, how does it manage this? And it's like, well, how would you have done that if it was just an application running on a VM somewhere, right? What if that mm -hmm. application went down? So you want to make sure that you don't overcomplicate things in this world. You still want to think, okay. If this was just an application running on a VM and that application instance went down, what would I have done? Yep. Speaking of going down. Speaking of going down, oh no, we... our node has failed. Now what happens? Well, again, Kubernetes tries to reconcile this. How does it reconcile it? It uses that data that's in etcd. That controller is going to say, well, you told me two pods. I'm going to try to make two pods. And it puts the pod on the same node, not the desired state. But well, so it is kind of a desired state because you said this is what I want. Not the optimal state, but still Kubernetes doing its darndest to try to make do with the resources it has. So did, does that confuse anyone? Would you have expected it to pull up another, like, another node? Oh, you can tell Yeah, exactly. Yep. So Kubernetes itself isn't going to be like doing the infrastructure management, right? It's orchestrating the workload. So you'd have to have secondary, secondary, um, I guess, policies in place to ensure that if a node goes down, that you have a way that you can bring a new node into the cluster. And this is where managed services can come available because now uh, the cloud provider can be more aware of infrastructure changes or what have you, and say, oh, hey, great, this has gone down, or hey, we need to make a new, deploy a new version of Kubernetes. Let's take one down and bring one up and manage that for you. There's a question. Ah, so the question is, if there's a new node that joins the cluster, then what happens? Uh, the answer is, you can control that. There's different ways you can say, hey, uh, I'm a, I am OK with this pod getting rescheduled after it's been started. And you can also say, I'm not OK with this pod getting rescheduled after started. So uh, there's 
uh, again, labels you can add to that. What's that? Um, you ideally don't want to update your pods. You, your pods should be immutable and never change, because if you make a change, Oh, can we just say scale to five instead? Yes, so that is an option inside Kubernetes. Um, How I would you do that? Update the deployment file. We'd update, update the deployment, deployment file. From three replicas to five. So and then five. we had that deployment, and we say, hey, ratings one had two replicas. What we're going to do is we're going to redeploy that same file, but we're just going to change two to five, and it's all going to be the exact same, because now, again, we've set our desired state and said this is what we want it to look like. So it would add three. It wouldn't deploy five, five new ones. It would just add three mm -hmm. and keep the two that are already there. No. Nope. You do not have to take the, oh, yeah, the question is, uh, that happens when the cluster's up and running, but what happens if, like, do you have to take the cluster down? And no, you can still have the cluster up and running because all it's doing is starting these containers on the VMs or the bare metal, and it's gonna, it can kill them, and it can uh, bring them back up without having to redeploy the cluster. You wanna keep in mind too, I know you talked about redistribution when a new VM comes up. If, let's say you didn't have any kind of like redistribution policy at all. Let's say that both of those nodes were scheduled on, you know, node two, and then node one comes up and node two goes down. You have no containers running, you have no pods, right? So luckily, because you had some type of um, you have the deployment, it's going to put two new pods on the other. But the goal is that you want to make sure that you aren't getting into a situation where even one, you know, your, your cluster gets to the point where a couple of nodes could go down, another node could be up, and there's still desired state, but one of them isn't running on that. Does that make sense? So you just don't want to get to a point where like three pods of one type are running on one node and not on any of the others, because then if that one goes down. So assuming uh, I have two Ideally, my application startup would be pretty quick. Unfortunately, it's a uh, old application. It's 30 minutes long. It's crazy. Can you uh, figure the time to take to Kubernetes or you try to back up? So, yeah, the, the question was hey, what if we have a really old application that takes minutes to start up and we want it to boot up, but we don't want it to start receiving traffic yet? Is that accurate? So Kubernetes has the concept of a liveliness and a readiness probe. The readiness probe says, start sending me traffic. And you can just say, no, 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 and they can configure to reread every five seconds. The liveliness probe is, maybe it's still running, but it got into a bad state. And so you can say, hey, I am no longer live. Uh, so the readiness probe is, it'll start sending traffic after the readiness probe hits, starts saying yes, and the liveliness probe is, I'm still in an okay state to receive traffic as long as that liveliness probe is available. Uh, that's, that's a good question. How, how much of the maximum time that you have configured to your HP? Because my application takes 30 minutes. Uh, we didn't, so does. So I, I worked with, uh, oh, I can't say who. Large, large company used to make printers. Um, and they had one that took about you know five to ten minutes. <laughs> now, is it your application that takes long, or is it that instance of the process that takes that long to come up? The the whole application. Okay. So then, if you bring up new instances of the process, are each one of those going to be thirty minutes? Every one of them is thirty minutes. Okay. I would I would uh, I would be caught. like that's an example of. Can you get the benefits of Kubernetes if if you have a thirty minute startup time? Well, maybe we can talk afterwards. Yeah. I'm, curious, I'm really curious as to like <laughs> me too, me too. what is gonna what what is the what's happening behind the scenes. And let's talk afterwards. So, did you have a, a warm pod? Um, a warm pod, basically one that's there but just not receiving traffic. I don't. I mean, there's a cost implication, but you know if. It, if it, Thing is you want to make sure that you have something available in case something happens. So you're, you're, already, you're already paying for the, you're paying for the nodes. So you're paying for the nodes. So you might as well just have five instances of it running, receiving traffic, right? 
I mean, technically you could run another one, change the label on it and not have anything go to it, but you're already paying for it. So you might as well just have like, start up all of your replicas, one goes down, it distributes it across the, the other ones, and then while the other one's coming back up, then that one, will, once it's ready, will get traffic again. That would be my approach. Yeah, I know like with the load balancer uh, service, you can have something where it is starting up a virtual machine and kind of keep it you know, in a warm startup. Like, you know it's going to take a long time to bring up that VM. Mm -hmm. And then you switch it off. So the question is, uh, you know, can you have it warm but not receiving traffic? And one thing we will talk about in services, uh, as you can see soon, um, services is about you can have blue-green deployments. And that might be close to what you're talking about. Uh, it's not exactly because what you're talking about is a bit different. You are wanting warm. You want it to be alive but not receiving traffic. And you can do that. It's just not a, um, a standard procedure. I mean, in his case, it sounds like it should be. There, there might need some re-architecture. Let's discuss after, just to make sure we get through all the content, and then we'll go yeah. through some of Oh, yeah, we are, we're we running a bit behind. So services, we were talking before. How Sorry. does... Oh, yes, sir. It, so yeah, the question is, what is the readiness probe? And it, it's something that runs inside the container. Very often, it's a HTTP probe. Or you can even have a shell script that runs and says, hey, look, I'm ready, no, and it doesn't exit with an error code. Um, but Or, you can, again, have the HTTP probe, which is the more common one, and it just makes an HTTP call, hey, is it ready, is it ready? And it just calls that every two seconds or so. And then once it says it's ready, then now it's live to start receiving traffic. Basically, in the configuration file, you can literally, there's a readiness probe and live, live, live liveliness probe. And you can give it an endpoint, and then you can say how often you want to check it to. So the question from a while back was, how do we actually talk to these pods? Well, we've got pod one and pod two. Um, the concept is called a service. Now, a lot of things, actually, I realized I should have mentioned this early on, is Kubernetes, what it does really well is provide abstractions. And this is another abstraction that it adds, is the concept of a, of a service. So what is a service? It basically says, here is a, um, a definitive way for you to re make requests to all of the pods behind this. Think of it like a load balancer. It's a very simple load balancer. And what it does is it says, all of the pods that have this label, app equals ratings, I'm gonna distribute traffic. And externally, I'm gonna, except port 8080, but whenever I receive traffic, I'm going to send it to the back-end pool of port 3000. And you can have an internal load balancer, such as it's only available inside the cluster. You can have an external load balancer, such that it actually talks to the cloud provider, gets a load balancer, um, and then gives you like a public IP address or what have you. So, well, does it... Yes, sir. It's round robin. So, are you familiar with IP tables? Uh, okay. So, underneath the hood, uh, it's all IP tables, which is what Linux uses for doing some really crazy networking. Uh, funny enough, here's the little trivia for you: uh, service, the IPs you get in services. Uh, so there's an IP address that, you know, that host name, you actually get a host name called ratings-web that is available to the entire cluster, and there's an IP address that's, uh, that DNS returns. That IP address doesn't technically exist. It only exists in IP tables. You will hopefully never need to know that information. <laughs> yes, sir. So you're asking, whenever you expose the service, it exposes 30, it should only ever expose the port, the explicit port that you're telling it. Uh, 
on your services. Hmm. But you know, you do that yeah. And I have seen that uh you know, some companies or in the Okay, I'm curious to see that one because I haven't run across that. Uh, so the question is, you've seen that it only exposes ports 3,000 3, and above. Right. Uh, but I've exposed 80. Like 80, 80 is a pretty common one. Uh, 80, 443, uh, those are fairly common ports. Uh, 3,000 is a Node.js typical port. Um, so yeah, I haven't run across, as long as it's below the, oh gosh, it's like the 30,000 port range, I forget, like 32,000, the, uh, but yeah, node ports is something else, and we won't, we'll briefly cover that, but uh, yeah, you might be thinking of node ports. Node ports are, uh, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll cover node ports in just a bit. So services, again, a way of providing abstraction, you get a DNS um, host name that goes to an IP address, which doesn't exist, and that IP address will round robin to each of these pods. So what does this look like again? Hey, we've got a deployment. We've deployed pod one, but one, but two. Now we're gonna deploy our service. What does this look like? Well, now we have this, again, this kind of ethereal, ethereal path, this doesn't really exist service that just you can use to talk to Ratings Web, uh, like a host name of Ratings Web that has an IP address. And so now all these the other pods. Too, sorry. So the goal of the service is basically to be a logical abstraction across all of the same instances, you know, all of the instances of the same container that are running, right? So that means if I want to scale to 13, right, from three, all of those, if I have a service picking that particular label, then it's going to actually sit over all 13 instances, right? So it gives us a stable endpoint that we can hit regardless of what's happening with the pods. They're going down, they're going up, they're scaling. All of that's going to be abstracted because that's that uh, selector and the label are going to match. So that service is going to distribute them across all of the able, available pods, no matter what's happening. Because if you're hitting individual pod IPs, and one of those pod go, pods goes down, you know what? Um, I think this actually might be a good time to break out into the, uh, the CLI cool. and start showing things. Yeah. What do you think? Cool. Yeah. Can you talk? Sure. All right. No, a service is totally a Kubernetes object. So that's that's Kubernetes no matter where it's deployed. So pods, services, all of that is totally any any Kubernetes instance or implementation. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and also if you're interested, this is all on GitHub. So our AKS cluster has been created. Uh, we've got our version 1.13 and everything. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called get credentials. And the get credentials okay. uh, is going to go, and there's a certificate uh, uh, that you can use that has the endpoint, it has the, like, the public endpoint, as well as all the certificate data to talk to it. So now uh, I can start yes. talking to my cluster. What's that? I just don't know if anyone can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Ish. Okay, talk. Use use the outdoor voice. I'm going to use the outdoor voice now. All right. So, Kubernetes. One of the things it has is called namespaces, and we haven't covered that. But namespace is just a logical grouping. So I am going to look at the available namespaces. There's a default. There's a kube public and a kube system. Kube system. We really, for the most part, shouldn't need to touch. The uh, system has all of those pods that are going to be deployed as the, you know, the kubelet and all those things that we talked about earlier, right? All the cube stuff. So now I'm going to create my own namespace. Ideally, you don't want to use the default namespace. It's just a best practice. Typically, too, when you're thinking about how you're going to manage a cluster in production, if you're going to do, hey, we want to logically isolate the cluster, so we want to use one cluster and have multiple teams deploying their applications inside of it, they'll usually use namespaces as a way to segment the existing cluster, right? But then there's also physical isolation, which is I'm going to run you know, a cluster for this team, a cluster for this team, a cluster for prod, a cluster for test. So it's a different, it's a strategy choice we make. Yep. So now that I've created my namespace, I, I now want to go to it. I'm basically saying, hey, Set my default namespace now to this uh, Kubernetes demo namespace. Um, now, the first thing I want to do is let's, uh, I'm going to run this command kubectl run 
Quart. I'll show you what Quart is. Uh, you'll actually see what it is in just a bit. And I'm saying this is that image. Remember that TGZ file, that container image? I'm saying go get it from Google's container registry. Don't ever restart it. And then just do a dry run. And out the dash O is YAML. And so this is going to create this quart.yaml file. So let me just talk about this for a second while you're doing this. So when you use dry start, essentially what that allows you to do is the output of that will come out in YAML. So remember we talked about we always want to use configuration whenever we're running these on our on our cluster, right? Because we want those to be managed, we want them to be versioned, all of that stuff. So it's a cool way to kind of trick the system and say instead of having to go create a YAML file from scratch, I'm actually going to run this command. It's not actually going to go into the cluster at all. It's just going to output what it actually would have run as YAML. So then you can use that YAML moving forward and apply that to the cluster. Make sense? So uh, normally, whenever you're deploying things, you want to, again, declare your state. If I were to just, the next command I'm going to do is just the Kubernetes run. This is not the normal way you deploy it. This is, might be a way to do like test things out. But again, if you're thinking about scalability and DevOps, you really want to have this configuration file, this YAML, and you apply this YAML to the cluster. So this is an example of what it is. And now I'm going to run quad get pod. And what did it do? It told me, hey, pod created. What does that look like? So, so I'm kubectl get pods. Hey, I've got one running. Kubectl describe pods. Well, you can see uh, how long it took. Uh, yeah, so it started the container about 11 seconds ago. It uh, then pulled the image, or it successfully pulled the image, and then assigned it to a very specific VM. Uh, here's some extra metadata for it. Uh, you can see the labels. We're talking about the node and anything else about this. Yeah, and then the name for this pod. Oh, yeah, and the namespace that's set. So if we run kubectl get, uh, get pods dash in, or sorry, get uh, dash wide, you can see, great. Here's the IP address for that pod. Here's how long it's been running. Here is the node. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, is it ready and what have you. Uh, so now, now that we've got our pod, let's expose it. Uh, because again, this is just right now, the pod's running, but it's just soaking up compute resources. So what we want to do is expose it. What exposing it is, remember we were talking about those services? You can expose it internally, so it's only available inside the cluster, but that's going to be not that interesting. I want to do and expose it to the world. This is a very, if you're not ready for it, this is a very insecure thing to do. Um, because kubectl get svc. Um, so this is telling us, remember that service? I've created a service called quad pod. It's of type load balancer. And there's a cluster IP address. That's, again, that IP address that doesn't truly exist. And right now, it's going out. And it's talking to Azure. It's talking to Azure and saying, hey, Azure, go get me a load balancer, a public load balancer. And hey, Azure, go get me a public IP address. And so when this is done, uh, we'll give this a little bit. But whenever this is done, we'll have a public IP address that will go, and all the traffic will go specifically to this pod. So there's um, just the way that this is happening. I know we said it's going to go spin up a load ba balancer in Azure. So Kubernetes still has the concept of all of these types of services. But depending on the cloud provider, provider that you use, there's going to be a cloud controller that basically reconciles the, the command that you're running and make sure that it uh, works with the underlying cloud provider to do what you need to do, right? So if you're running this in um, you know, Amazon's EKS, I think it's right, um, it's going to spin up an Amazon like hosted load balancer, right? So just keep that in mind, that this is Azure specific, but the service concept isn't. Just the implementation of how that, what that load balancer is, is specific to Azure. All right, so now uh, Azure, we've got our public load balancer. Again, this is a public IP address from Azure. And you know what? If anyone wants to, boom, you can go to, oh, actually, this takes a little bit, because just that the load balancer has come up. Uh, give it a little bit. I keep forgetting. I try to hit it too soon. 
and then it's never happy whenever I do it that very first run. Are you going to make a fool of me? So while he's doing that, we ran a pod, right? We did kubectl run pod. What is not ideal about that? Yep. Okay. Well, well, yes, that's good. That's good. But I guess I mean, why would we not just go to the command line and run a, a run pod? What happens if that pod goes down? It's gone. It's gone. We don't have any workload running. We don't have anything to receive traffic. So what would we use to make sure that we do have that wrapped in a desired state? A deployment, right? Yep. So very rarely will you just deploy a pod unless you were deploying it willy nilly to maybe like do some testing, have something in the address space, something like that. So this is a so this is an example uh, pod. Uh, and it's basically a service that's running in Go. There's a great book called Kubernetes Up and Running. The, let me see if I can it up. Uh, yeah, the, there's a Kubernetes Up and Running book, and they use this as their demo app, and I found this to be great, and you'll see why. Um, but again, this is quite insecure. So yeah, I may be exposing sensitive information. We'll see why. Because here are some of the service IP, uh, the service Hosts, so now people can kind of get a little idea of what's happening inside this cluster. Um, you can see memory that's happening. So this is all just an example service that people can be running. Uh, you can also do a file system browser. So you can start looking. It's really tight. Okay. Uh, so again, this, this specific pod, uh, this specific container is kind of cool because you can see oh, what's one that has stuff in it. Um, yeah, so hey, this is Alpine release 3.2 or 3.82. Anyway, we'll be using this uh, throughout the uh, this demo. And so now here, can you hold this? So great, we've got this. We've got this pod. It's up and running. We've got a public service. Um, and now, oh, you can even see the IP address that it's coming in on is uh, that 10.244.2.2. So, well, what are we going to do? We're going to kill the pod. We're going to get the pods, oopsctl, get or delete pod, cord pod. Uh oh, what's happened? No, you can't see, you can barely see it, but uh, now uh, it's running because it's got, it had that service and now it's trying to send it and there's no pods available. This is why, uh, again, what Kinda was talking about, you don't want to do that. Uh, you don't want to do it through the command line uh, by just saying, hey, run pods. Wait, there are no pods running. So what we really want is a deployment. So what does a deployment look like? Yeah, that's an order. Uh, they're deprecating some of this. So the deployment. Really? Uh, uh, try refresh, doing a hard refresh. Okay, because I can promise you there's there's nothing serving that right now. I believe I'm almost yeah. It it's got to be the cache on your phone because there's nothing serving this right now. Like that pod is dead. Uh, would someone else be willing to try it on their phone? Does not work for you. Okay. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there, so there's there's truly CDL get pods. Now it's dead? Okay. So yeah. So uh, essentially what we're doing here now is we're switching over to using a deployment. So you can see we did the same dry run, but it generated instead of just a pod configuration file, it, it generated the deployment configuration file. And that's just good if you don't want to start from scratch, right? You can basically tell it, hey, I want you to go ahead and generate this for me. So the interesting part of this deployment that we care about right now is this replicas five. And then here we're talking about the image. And we're calling this whole thing again the quad deployment. So what I'm going to do is this. Not yet. Great question. So you would typically have the deployment and then you have a services YAML. So you end up having a bunch of YAML files, right? One for the deployment, one for the service, one for the ingress controller, all of those things. Now I'm going to go to CTL, get pods. 
Hey, there's five of these running now. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can parameterize it using, like, typically when people will use Helm, and then they'll have, like, a Helm chart. But we'll get into that in a little bit, hopefully showing some more. So, yeah, great question. So the, the question is, what happens if you want to parameterize it? And there you're thinking of what she's called, talking about called Helm, where you ex explicitly parameterize it, and then you, you can insert certain values for it. And I'll be uh, demoing that just a bit. So, hey, now we've got all five of our, of our pods running. Um, I'm sorry? You can just add a service, yeah. yeah. So typically you're gonna you're gonna want your deploy the first, right? Because then you need to have you know five, you'll say, hey, I want five replicas of this pod with this label, and then your service will select over those labels. So if they didn't exist, it actually what the service wouldn't be exposing anything at that time. Yeah. So the question is, uh, does it matter which which order you do it in? And the answer is no. Um, you can create a service that has nothing behind it, and you get exactly what we saw is that it's not able to be found. Or you create your deployment, and then now you realize, hey, your my applications are running fine, and then create your service, and then it'll uh, that'll be the first route you saw, which was uh, now it's got something to route to. So hey, let's look at our deployments. Now we've got our core deployment. There's five of them. Um, and we've got our pods. Uh, this one deployment has created five pods. Let's kill, delete pod, delete that one. So what we just did is we killed one of the five available pods. But since we declared a deployment, what Kubernetes is going to do is go reconcile, and it's going to spin up another one to hit five. So what are we going to have? We're going to have five pods. Um, one of them is uh, was only born 12 seconds ago. Cool. Uh, again, reconciliation. We told it we want five, one dead. Uh, it'll still try to fix that. So now let's go and expose that one. Another thing to think about too, just while he's so what, what he's doing is creating a service that's going to expose uh, a consistent endpoint that you can hit that's going to distribute the load across the five pods. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about is there are best practices around making sure that all of your pods have a certain CPU and memory. Like they request those things because you don't necessarily want one container or one pod to steal all the CPU and memory in your cluster. So just keep that in mind. Those are things that you should be researching after this. Like what's the best practice for the configuration I should set on each pod? Yes, sir. Oh, great question. So, ah. Uh, so the question was about logging. Yeah. So what do we do with all the logs? I think this is a great time for our sponsor. Oh, I think our sponsor is a bit busy right now. Um, yeah, so the question is, yeah, what about logs? Because as these co start coming up, this is where uh, a company such as Datadog really fits in well. Because what they will do is they will take all these logs, aggregate it to a central location, so that um, it doesn't matter, pods die, nodes die, whatever, that there's one central location that all of your logs get aggregated to. And you can keep it. You can have retention policy. Uh, and that's, yeah. So that's exactly what uh, like the what Datadog fills. Also, you can do you can do a QCTL logs, and that'll actually show you the logs for each pod at any given time. And then typically, I would say what what I what I see is that it's deployed as a daemon set. So you have a logging agent that's running on each of the nodes. It'll aggregate the output of like the standard output, standard input type stuff into um, you know whatever your third party tool is that you use for visualization, but. Typically, it's a data set that's deployed, um, but you can also have a sidecar in your pod. So sometimes you'll have basically a sidecar that does all the logging, and that'll be in the same pod as your container. Okay. If you want to do something like what? I'm sorry. Elk. Yep. The elk stat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that's one option you can do as a sidecar. Uh, another one I see uh, is it'll use it as a daemon set, 
a daemon set is something that runs on each node. That's okay. Um, I, we just covered that one. The uh, daemon set. Okay. So then, yeah, the daemon set basically on each node, and it has access. We're talking about mounting file systems. It'll mount the file system of the root host, so and it's constantly looking at the log, uh, the log directory because as these containers are uh, generating logs, they're actually behind the scenes getting written to a lo log file on the root system, and so the daemon set is going to be monitoring that and then can send all that back. Or you can also do it as uh, as a uh, a sidecar. Uh, a sidecar is remember how I was saying that a pod. Usually has just one container. Well, sidecars, like the the cases where you'd have two containers, uh, it's just think of it like a sidecar on top of a motorcycle or next to a motorcycle. So recommending it's, it's different. It depends on the logging tool you're using. So they'll have an approach. So like if you're using like um, Azure Monitor for containers, which is like the Azure native, we deploy the logging agent as a daemon set. Um, so it, it really just depends. I think Prometheus Metrics also uses a daemon set. Um, so it'll depend. It'll depend on the tool. They might say, like, hey, we, if you implement this logging schema, like, you'll, you'll deploy this particular pod, pod, uh, container as a, inside of your pod. So typically they specify the approach. But I would say a daemon set is what I, I see the most often. OK, so to now show uh, services with deployments, hey, we've got our New external IP address, this 23, 100, 122, 187. We go there, and you can see this is serving on, yeah, uh, 10, hard refresh, so 25. You can see it's serving on different IP addresses because now we're, we're going over the different pods, right? Why is it keeps going bouncing back to the same one? Oh, am I doing a hard refresh? You're doing view. Yeah. OK. It's interesting. It seems to be bouncing back and forth between only two. Well, let's take a look. So there's my one. There's my two. Hmm. I don't know. I guess it's supposed to be round robin. I'm not too sure why it's not going across those three. Um, one thing that we can uh, one oh four. 104. Anybody feel free to type this in your phone. 214. Alice Texas, there we go. 51. 111. Oh, I gave you the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, 23. 23. 100. 100. 122. 187. I got it from 2.3. Okay. So you're getting only two, but yeah. I got a different one than you. OK, you did. Interesting. I just got two, two, five, two, three. OK, so yeah. And also, you can see that that prefix, actually, it's coming from that same host. Uh, the zeros are going to be on one host. Uh, and this is just the way that Azure segments out the network. So anyway, let's look at this. Since I seem to be getting that 1.4, I'm going to look at the logs. Oopctl log oop, dash f, and I am going to huh, yeah, it's kind of funny. You can see it keep bouncing back here for me. I'm not too sure why it's doing that. I don't have uh, sticky sessions on. But anyway, so this is, uh, so now, actually, hey, let's kill it. You know what? I don't like that pod. So the nice thing here, though, is we can hit the same IP address, and it doesn't matter to us if that pod went down, right? We can technically kill all of those pods, and it wouldn't matter to us, because we have the stable external IP address that we can hit, and it's going to load balances across whatever the new pods it spins up on. So cool, that pod's dead now, but I'm still my service oh, yeah. is up. Why? Because it's that still it's doing the load balancing. Uh, again, it was weird that it was sending me to a specific one, but now that that one was gone, it immediately uh, refreshed the list of backend tools. All right. Yeah. Yes. 
sorry. Oh, what's the address? I don't know. Yeah, I think he was asking about on the court application, right? Oh, uh, sure. The twenty three one hundred. Yeah. No, he's asking oh. for you to pull it up, like literally open. Oh, up. literally open. Okay, sure. Ah, okay. So what is this? Whenever it comes in from the uh, to the to the cluster, that's actually the entry point that it's get that it sees it from. Now. I, uh, no, she, yeah, I'm hitting here. So yeah, that's actually the 244 is the host, Where if I remember correctly. Yeah. It's the IP address that you can go to. Like whenever we make the request, right? Yep. So, oh, it's not the two. Oh, wait, no, hold on. IP address. I should know this offhand. The 244, I thought was the services. Yeah, I don't know. Let's look into that just yeah, for a little I'll get time. Back to I don't know why we're not resolving that, but we'll figure that out. I just don't spend too much time. Yeah, thank you. Time. I'm going to rat hole on that. Yeah. I'll have, uh, we'll just look at it after we're done and we'll let you know. Okay. So, did I get rid of my. All right, any other questions about services? Now we're at 819. Should we describe Helm or should we just go straight into Helm? Demo Helm. Um, we should probably, I mean, we should probably at least explain what this. All right, let's explain so, what Helm is. So we're, we're running a little bit low on time. I don't think we have to go through the whole deck. So we have more in here that we wanted to show y'all. We obviously want to talk a little bit about ingress and networking, but um, just based on the timeline, we're not going to be able probably to cover all of that. A couple of things to keep in mind, and we'll, we'll just kind of do care if I just kind of pick this up and I'll just kind of walk through it. Okay, so when it comes to scaling and high availability, a couple things to keep in mind, right? If you want to scale a pod, the best way to do that is through a deployment. I think we've covered that pretty well. Um, so the reason we want to do this is because if we went in and scaled something up to 20, and then later that night went and changed our deployment and said, hey, I want to scale up to five, there's going to be a conflict there. The nice thing is you can actually do is use CTL diff, and you can see what's going to actually happen if you apply something to your cluster which helps you make sure, oh, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to accidentally scale this down by 15 because John went and scaled it without doing it and config his code. So just keep that in mind. And then this is just kind of, hey, we're going to de uh, de create or update the new deployment and make sure that we have additional pods. If we want to scale nodes, we do that based on the provider that we're using, right? If it's Azure, we can actually use something called um, node count and we can increase that. There's also the concept of VM scale sets, which is basically like, hey, I want to make sure that I can actually scale out um, in an automated way. If one of my, you know, if my nodes are hitting a certain CPU and memory threshold, I actually want Kubernetes to Kubernetes in Azure, um, communicating to the infrastructure to bring up a new node. So when you're thinking about scaling, there's two types of scaling. There's scaling your pods. Hey, I went from one replica to five, and then there's scaling your nodes. I now want, I have five VMs. Now I want ten. So scaling the cluster and scaling the workload, right? Two different, two different things. It only scales the, the pods. Now, there is something called the cluster autoscaler, where Kubernetes can kind of manage itself and say, just as it went and got a load balancer and an IP address, it can also say, hey, I'm running low in resources. There's all these pods that are scheduled but aren't being deployed because there's not enough resources. Please go get me another one. And then... It can do that, but by default, it doesn't. And there's add-ons that will allow you, to, uh, the Kubernetes, to be self-aware, mm -hmm. not like Skynet, but still aware of its, uh, aware of the backlog of containers. So yeah, you can configure it to do that. The same way that you can also configure auto scaling of pods, right? You can say, hey, I want to add new pods, but I don't want to have to. Auto I don't always want to have to go in and change the deployment file. I want that to happen based on the metrics that are hitting each of the pods. So we can scale the nodes, especially if you're using a managed service, typically that's going to talk to the underlying cloud provider. Um, have any of you heard of virtual nodes or the virtual kubelet project? 
So has anyone worked, has anyone heard of serverless? You know, this like new movement towards basically abstracting all of the infrastructure away, you know, consumption, all that kind of stuff. So essentially imagine a serverless node in your cluster. So what that's gonna look like is it's basically gonna look like a VM in your cluster with an unlimited amount of CPU and memory. So what that would look like is, hey, I had two nodes, those nodes have hit capacity, and now I just wanna start bursting on what looks like an unlimited node. And so you'll start bursting pods into that space. Now, is that really just something abstract? No, it's another VM sitting in Azure. But the point is, it's something that you can basically just start spinning out as many containers as you want. So in the back end, it's using Azure Container Instances, which is essentially kind of our more serverless container hosting option. And underneath the hood, it's VMs that are already warmed up. We don't have to spin another VM, bring it into your cluster. Uh, we've got those warmed up and ready to start accepting containers. And this is useful too, because if you have a bursty workload, maybe you don't, we are not at the point where you can have serverless Kubernetes, right? That's not a thing that exists yet, where you can just not spin up and worry about any VMs. I, I definitely think that is coming, there. right? But it's not like that for now. So this is really good if you had un an unexpected amount of traffic come and you didn't want to have to wait for the VM uptime. You could go ahead and, and burst over into um, the virtual node and then bring up maybe a more stable, steady state VM that you can then move those workloads on to. Cool. Yes. Yes. Same region. Same region. Yeah. Now, uh, the virtual Kubelet project was started by Microsoft, but open source. So you, that's also, I think, Amazon actually has adopted that project and implemented it as well. Um, pod updates. Just keep in mind that your service, um, if you want to update the image that's running inside of your pod, you would essentially change that deployment file and pass it a different image, right? Um, your service abstraction will also be updated so that you can basically say, hey, I'm going to spin up v2, and as I spin up each instance of v2, I'm going to spin down each instance of v1, and I'm going to point the service at the v2 instance. So that would be more of a um, blue-green, or I mean, excuse me, rule. If you want to do blue-green, what you would do is you basically say, hey, I'm going to have all of v1 still running, and then I'm going to deploy v2, and then change the service to look at v2, and then I'll bring down v1. So this might be what we were talking earlier of having some of these warm and ready to go. You basically spin up v2, and then use that service to do an atomic change of like at once all your traffic now goes from V1 to V2 rather than a rolling update where you will have different versions at the same time. You can also segment the amount of traffic going to each one. You know, there, there's some level of autonomy there. Like, hey, I want 20% of my traffic to go here progressively. Okay, storage. How are we doing on time? Okay, we have five minutes. <laughs> Um, do you want to go through this? Yeah, I mean, we'll pass on storage. Yeah, so we're going to pass on storage. Here's the things about storage. The things that you should really look into initially are persistent volumes and persistent volume links, and then using cloud provider uh, storage. Okay, that's what I would say. Summary. Yeah. So again, volumes are a way of injecting a uh, a disk or some mount into your container. Because again, we're talking about what if you have an application that has state? Well, have your state be outside of the container. So the container itself can live and die, but the life cycle of your application, you want to keep that persistent past the life cycle of the container. So you have some other disk that you inject into it, and then as it dies and it moves around to different uh, nodes even, because remember, if a whole node dies, you want that to be able to go to the other one uh, and use that as the externalization of your state. Yeah, if you like, if you had all of your files on your computer and your computer crashes, and you want to use those same files, and you don't have them on an external hard drive, then you just plug in. You know, it's it's very much that concept. You really want to make sure that the data is persisting beyond the life cycle of the actual uh, pod. When it comes to networking, we kind of covered the services concept, right? We need to be able. Well, this is actually just now. In Kubernetes, it's a flat network. All of the pods can communicate with all of the other pods, even across the spaces. So it doesn't, it's not innately isolated. So that means typically you're going to use network policies to make sure that traffic is only going between the pods that you want to communicate. So this flat network is internal, so all of these are getting their own IP address. And then we use services when we talk about external communication because we want to make sure that we have that level of abstraction, right? We want the consistent external IP address that we can hit no matter what's going on with the pods. There's also a couple of other types of services that we, we won't go too much into it, I'll just talk on them here. Cluster IP is the internal pod IP that you can give a container that you say, hey, we don't want this to get any external traffic. So maybe it's like 
My front end will get an exposed load balancer service, but my back end that talks to the front end, that's only going to be accessible via other pods in the cluster. No external traffic should ever be that pod. Make sense? And then node port is I want to be able to hit that service on the same port on all of the nodes in the cluster. So you could say, hey, I want a node port of you know, 3,000. That would mean any node in your cluster, you hit 3,000 nodes in that pod. So yeah, pod to service, it all stays inside. For a cluster IP, all stays inside the cluster. Load balancer, some external uh, load balancer is going to send in the traffic. And then node port, every VM or every whatever is going to have that specific port. And so no matter what you do, you can talk to that. Ingress, we haven't really talked on, but just keep in mind, so I believe that the load balancer that you get with the service is like level four load balancer, but if you want more autonomy, a little bit more control, you can get a level seven load balancer, which is more like an ingress, right? An ingress and an ingress controller, so you can do like route-based um, or path-based routing to all the different services in your cluster. Um, Nginx is the default one with Kubernetes, but you can bring your own if you have to adapt uh, yeah, basically, use you would use the Ingress controller for SSL termination, host-based routing, or path-based routing. Uh, those are more common scenarios for them. And I would say most customers are using Ingress. Um, if you're doing Kubernetes or if you're doing it for a while, most likely you will be using that. Okay. Let's skip, do you want to skip over the review? Yeah, we'll skip over the review. So we're going to skip over the review. Um, I know that it's, we're almost out of time. We have about one minute left. So we want to touch on Helm very briefly. Yeah, Helm. Helm is a way of packaging. If you're familiar with uh, NPM, if you're familiar with uh, apt-get, homebrew, all of these different ways, uh, chocolatey. Chocolatey. Uh, um, it's just another packaging format. So let's see what this looks like. While he's pulling that up, keep in mind, so why do we want this? Because you're not going to want to go say, create the deployment, create the service, create the ingress, create the network policy, create the, <laughs> all of that's just going to, it's a ton of game. So eventually, you're gonna, you want to say, hey, I want to have a Helm chart where I package up all the YAML, I can parameterize it, I can deploy it to different environments, I can do rolling upgrades, all that stuff, that's kind of what Helm does for you. I would say that it is the de facto standard for package, package management or application management in Kubernetes. Yep. It takes about uh, 30 seconds or so to get started up. Now, what's interesting, Helm 3.0, definitely worth looking into. There's a great article series on Helm's website talking about the new Helm. Um, version because if you go try to learn it now and you see anything that has Tiller in it, Tiller's going away. So I would just recommend checking out the new documentation to, to learn about Helm from the beginning, starting with the logo. Okay. It's worth probably knowing about Tiller, but the new Helm will have Tiller. So we kicked off another deployment, uh, another deployment of a service. This is actually deployed a Helm chart. So uh, I just kind of kicked that off in the background so we can get that going. I installed Helm, uh, I knitted it. There's actually some RBAC that we need to set up uh, to give Helm permissions. Then I installed it, and then now what I installed is um, Minecraft. Because, you know, it's Minecraft. Microsoft, we kind of do Minecraft now. Ah. I actually just downloaded the Minecraft Education Edition, which is a completely different beast. So what I did is I installed a Minecraft server. And give this a little bit. And while that's loading, just to give context, when I said Tiller is going to be taken out of Helm, Helm has a server, uh, like a, basically a backend component that talks to that's sitting in Kubernetes. So it's basically that, that service that Helm is talking to. And he said, hey, go deploy this. Tiller would be the server side component. That server side component is basically. That's what I did. Minecraft was updating. Fine. Now, he didn't do a kubectl, create pod, create deployment. He didn't do any of that, right? Because it's all bundled in the Helm chart. There's really great tutorials out there that will explain what comes with the Helm chart, how you renderize it, all that stuff. So anyone else here have Minecraft install their computer because their, their little one wants them to? Any Minecraft things? Uh, no. So, well, I mean, I'm running Minecraft and he's connecting on my to machine. And he's deployed into the cluster. Yeah. And so... Yeah, so what he just did is he did a describe, and he was able so to get the external... You remember the service that was created? It has now created a public endpoint 
Uh, and then now I said, hey, connect to this Minecraft server. Oh, that last one was the one I tore down the other day. So to be respectful of y'all's time, I know it's 8.30 and you have to leave, it's totally fine. Um, sorry that we went a little bit long. I hope this was educational for all of you. Um, our Twitter handles and everything are in the PowerPoint, which we'll make sure to share out with you. But we'll also stick around for the next you know, 10, 15 minutes and answer any questions y'all have if you want to stick around. Oh, it's still respawning. Oh, wait. Darn, I was hoping that this would go a bit faster, but since we're short on time. Does anyone have any questions while we start playing around with session? So, Helm has, it, it's a little bit hard to describe the new architecture, because honestly, I haven't dove into it that much, but it used to be that Tiller would run on your master. Um, I believe it ran on your master, not on each of the work nodes. Is that correct, Tommy? That Tiller would run on the master, or would it run each of the nodes? Not on each one, but it would run in your worker nodes. Okay, so it would run on the worker node, and basically, so Tiller's only running on one node, the worker node, the cluster. Now, what would come through your But that's not what that's okay. Okay. So, so I was explaining before, Tiller used to be installed on, was it, is it all of the worker nodes, or just one? Not all. It was, uh, just a. It was a deployment. Okay, so it would be a deployment, like maybe there's two instances of Tiller running inside the cluster. They've taken away that component, so now Helm's going to talk about doing the kubelet on each of the nodes, and that's what's actually going to run the, all of the YAML file. All of the YAML files that have been compiled in the Helm chart. Because essentially all it is is it's a bundle of Helm charts that you print your eyes and then you basically just So, Okay, so you would, uh, it would basically be a map, like, let's think of like a deployment pipeline, right? So you have your Helm chart, that Helm chart would be parameterized. You could send in parameters the same way that you do with the environment, right? I am this parameter, I want this name for the pod of this environment, blah, blah, blah. Um, when it comes to the image, we pull an image from the container registry, right? Once we've actually built that image, and what you're going to do is you're basically going to, um, what's the word I want to say? What's the story? You're using the same image. It's the same image that's progressing through each ring. And so your image should be the same, right? You want to deploy the same application. Now, you might have specific configuration and environment variables in your DevOps pipeline. But you're making sure that you're not, you're not rebuilding the image each time you go to a new environment. You're just progressing that image forward. Um, and then the Helm chart, like I said, can be parameterized. So you just pass in whatever the parameters are for that particular. So how would be like checked into your source code repository? Oh well, typically your Helm chart, you're going to use uh, some type of vault, right? You could use like a console, you could use um, uh, uh, key vaults in Azure, like depending on what environment you're going to. Typically, you're always going to want to secure those somewhere, right? But you can have Helm point to those things. Yeah. So typically that's going to be using, see, it's like a whole, right? We're going to, there's so many things. Like you could use manage identity to make sure that it actually has access to the secrets that are stored in a more secure vault, right? It comes to that kind of thing. So but typically, Helm charts would be version controlled in your source code. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So you're not going to put your secrets in there. That's going to happen in the DevOps pipeline. So like, let's take this for example. I'm going to install a MySQL instance. It is not a, another layer, but it's basically amalgamating all of the um, all of the charts or all of the. You know. So instead of like, let's say we had a DevOps pipeline, I was like, go create a deployment, go create a service, go create an address, right? That would be a lot. So instead, we say, hey, go apply this application to Kubernetes, and it's going to run the deployment, it's going to run the service. It's just basically a wrapper around all of those things to make it easier to manage and version. Because what if I want to do a, like, let's say I want to go deploy an application, right? I'm not trying to go deploy a service. That doesn't mean anything to me from a business context. I want to deploy an application. So if I go deploy this application in Kubernetes, I'd like to version all of those things together. Like, I want this version of the service, this version of the, uh, of the pod, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to be able to roll all of them back together. I don't want to have to go delete the deployment 
to the top seven of the So it's basically just a wrapper or a level of abstraction in a way so that you can um, package all those things together. So in Kindle, what I have behind Kindle right now oh, is an yeah. example of a, remember how I was saying it's a template file? So these are where uh, some of these values get templatized. So for example, we can have a value, or somewhere I saw here? Hey, look, if we create a value file and that has like the, the implementation of all of our values, so we got the template that does the templatization and then we've got the values that has the, what it's actually plugging in. And if we were to say, allow empty MySQL password, then there would be some environment variable that would have that set to true. Uh, or we can say, hey, look, you know, we can set out what our secret name is for the, uh, the MySQL password. And these are just examples of templates uh, and values that you can apply it to it. And what it does is whenever we deploy MySQL, it's deploying a deployment, it's deploying some secrets, a service monitor, and the service. So this is like a whole bunch of things rather than just like onesie twosie, hey, I just want to deploy the MySQL container, well, I want to think about the service of it as well. I need to think about secrets. I might want to have that volume. Remember we talked about inserting volumes into it to store the data. Well, this is what that volume might look like. Yeah, Kubernetes has a concept of config maps and secrets, but typically I see customers wearing their secrets and they like secure vaults external. Sorry, I know that's like that's like the obvious quickest dirtiest overview of Helm, but Helm, like I said, Helm 3.0, there's a like seven part uh, blog series that Brendan Burns helped out with, who's like one of the co founders of Kubernetes. And it's a really good series to walk through, and they can do it at one lunch, and it would help explain what Helm is and how it works. What is this deal? <laughs> Service oh, mesh. Yeah, it's, That's another, yeah. another meetup. So we'll probably have, a, yeah, there'll be another meetup on that. But the, the long short is it's what's called a service, it's an implementation of a service mesh. A service mesh is a way to thinking if you've got all these services, and what if you want to start adding some additional features between how they communicate? What if you want to make sure that when they communicate that they're using TLS? Because right now they're just using HTTP. What if you don't want service one to talk to service two? Like, what if you only want um, app one to talk to database one and app two to talk to only database two? Well, a service mesh can also help um, add that policy and prevent that and prevent that from happening. You can also use a service mesh to do distributed tracing. Let's say a request comes into one service, then goes to one pod, and it goes to a different pod, and it goes to a different pod, and you want to see what that whole thing looks like. Maybe. Uh, to know how fast it, like a, a blocker for it. You can use a service mesh for that. And what it does is it adds another level on side the Kubernetes service that can do a number of things such as introspect packets, introspect add tracing. Um, a lot of that helps just offload the networking responsibility to essentially like kind of a sidecar proxy. And that sidecar proxy's responsibility is making sure that the communication is happening the way that you want. Uh, I think it's HTTP and gRPC. Uh, I think it's, yeah, let's check, but I think it's HTTP and gRPC. Uh, um, oh, and TCP. Cool. So there you go. WebSocket as well. All right. Any other questions? Y'all learned no. a lot, hopefully. Great. Thank awesome. you very much.